but um, it's interesting because as you're, as you're doing vacation stuff, like we know in, 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 in the culture, sometimes there's like memes and, and jokes about, about vacation because vacation, how many of you know, vacation can actually be a little bit stressful. Like sometimes it's, 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 uh, it's stress of getting things together. And my wife and I were laughing at this meme the other day and it says, vacation booked. Now it's time for my wife to order 17 outfits for a seven day trip while I only take two pairs of shorts and two shirts that I've had since 2013. <laughs> She's like, it's true. <laughs> so we got all our stuff together for, for, our, for our vacation. And, and I'm not going to lie, like, it's, it's a lot. You know, we went to Lake George last year, and, and even that was or the year before, but even that, you know, that can be a lot. You're trying to find a place to go. You're trying to figure out what you're going to do. You got to pack all your stuff. You got you to remember to put the kids in the car when you're driving there. And this year, you know, going, going on, a, on a flight, if you're, if you're doing flying somewhere, if you're going to visit family or something, you're packing bags at home and you're weighing them because you don't want to be the one who's trying to, to put a a, a, a luggage under the plane and they tell you, I'm sorry, that's, that's, there's too much in there. And you're open that up in front of the line of people and you're going through your underwear and whatever else that you can throw out so that you can get it. You know, I'll buy those later. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy in line doing that, that person in line, but you got all kinds of stuff that go into vacation uh, planning. You got luggages. And if you're flying internationally, you're, you know, weighing luggages maybe, and you got passports. And like I said, figure out where you're staying. And uh, because we went to Columbia uh, this time, this is this was the first time that I was going to be driving in in, in Bogota, Colombia. Which which if you've ever if you've ever seen the, the show like Ice Road Truckers India, it's it's something like that. It's pretty wild. There's there's all kinds of, uh, of motorcycles and all kinds of all kinds of things. And you're still driving on the right side of the road as opposed to driving on the left. But it, it's a big change uh, for me. And I'm driving stick shift down there, which I haven't done in, in quite a while. And it's very like hilly and kind of mountainous. So how I many know like stick shift going up a hill is a little bit tough when you stop and. Um, I remember when we, when we first got down there, one of the things that we wanted to do that we, that we made, uh, we really wanted to make it important on our trip is that we wanted to go to church while we were down there. And, and one of our first days down there, it was, it was going to be Sunday morning. So we're like, okay, we planned out our trip that we're going to go to church on vacation. And, and Andrea's family is a pastoral family. And so we went to one of the churches that, that they pastor and it's, it's her uncle and her cousins. And it's like a kind of a family church. And, and it was like, they're, you know, godly men. They're amazing men. They care about their people. They, they're the kind of pastors that, that put people over programs instead of programs over people people over programs. And I love that. I love that. So, so we were driving there. We're trying to go to church on that Sunday morning. And I'm driving a stick shift in a city I've never driven in before where like sometimes the traffic laws are optional. I'm trying to figure out what's, what's optional and what's not. And, you know, driving the stick shift up and down the hills. And we went to, we went to drive to church and they had shut down like the main avenue in the city because there was a marathon. So there's like thousands of people running and, and my GPS, like every time I tried to cross the road to get to the church to drive over the road, it just kept saying like, however you say, recalculating in Spanish, <laughs> recalculando, 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 whatever. And I kept like having to turn around and, and I'm lost in this city and my family's in the back and we're driving around the hills and we don't know where we're going and, and, and we're just trying to get around. And every time we try to cross the road again, it's blocked again because there's thousands of people in a marathon. So it was stressful. Our kids are in the back and they're like, Daddy, where are we going? Like, do you know where we're going? I'm like, I have no idea, kids. <laughs> Buckle up, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and so eventually we found our way. We're like half an hour late to church or something. We found our way to church and we made our way in. And I was stressed out, right? You go through all this traveling and all this checklist and get everything done and then get down there and drive around and the road's closed and I kind of don't know what I'm doing and we're late to a church and that stresses me out as much as it is, but I'm, I'm like extra stressed out. And we come to this church and the back of the church is the only place where there's spots to sit. So we come in. I'm fine with that. We come in. We sit in the back. And, and as I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. And I'm, I'm kind of like a weary traveler. And I've been kind of frazzled. And, and all the stuff that I've been, you know, going through and kind of stepping in the last couple of days and our, our travels, like, you know, the, the stress and anxiety is just on me. And I'm, I'm watching from the back. I'm watching this church service happen. And and the people are, are just like pressing into worship. They're pressing into worship. And then, and then the word happens and, the, and they're pressing into the word. And they're, and they're, and they're it's a little bit of a different culture, but they're raising their hands and they're, they're saying, yeah, that's, that's me. You know, you're describing me. And there's like a little back and forth there with the pastor. And I'm, and I'm watching and I'm seeing and I'm saying like, you know, these, these, people are, these people are 
these people are, are very much like passionate about this and they're in and as I'm sitting in the back and they don't see me because I'm in the back, right? I stick out like a sore thumb down there, but they don't see me because I came in late. So I'm sitting in the back and I'm watching them and, and I'm seeing them worship God and I'm, I'm hearing them participate in the message and just be excited about what God is doing. And I'm thinking in my mind, man, back where I come from, my, my people in, in my culture, my home church here, the American culture, I know a bunch of people that are doing the same thing on the same Sunday morning. They might be on different continents, but they're praising the same God. They're lifting high the same word of God. The same name above all names, Jesus is the God on high, no matter the continent. Amen. So it was just such a cool thing. And it was refreshing to me to see in my weariness as a, as a, as a traveler, quite literally at that point in time. And it was exactly what I needed. And I, and I was looking there, I was sitting in the back and I was like, this is exactly what church is supposed to be. The church should be an oasis in the deserts of life. The church should be an oasis. Can we get that one up there, please? The oasis in the deserts of life. There we go. I even wrote it down. It's kind of important. <laughs> the church should be an oasis in the deserts of life. Uh, you assemble together to worship the Lord in unity. It was super cool. It was, it was very impactful for me. So um, I was watching from the back. You know, nobody could see me again. And I was watching. And I kind of had a bird's eye view of what was going on, the, the view from the rear. And um, there was a greeter there was a greeter that I had saw coming in and she's, she's just like a normal woman. She's, she's a, she's like a middle-aged woman, very, very sweet seeming, walked in, smiled. She said, she said, hello in Spanish, obviously it was hola. And then we go, we sit to it, we sit in our seats and while we're sitting in the seats and we're watching the, the, the service, like I can see from the back that she's, she's, she's kind of hustling around while the people are, are worshiping and she's, she's participating. She's, she's kind of raising her hand sometimes and she's interacting with the message, but she's also kind of walking around occasionally. I, wa I saw her grab a, smop, a spot mop and she came over and she was mopping behind a little bit behind everybody. So on the way out that there would be a nice clean floor and nobody was going to slip. And then a couple minutes later, I saw I saw an elderly man stand up and apparently he was, he was looking for the bathroom to go to the bathroom. And, and this woman came over and she grabbed him by the, by the shoulder, very sweet and kind and gentle and walked with him by the, by the arm, arm in arm. And, and actually had to go upstairs. So she walked with him up the stairs very slowly, took her time. At the top, he did his business. And when he came back down, she was there waiting for him with a, with a smile and she helped him back down the stairs. A couple minutes later, when they were doing the, the kind of the, the altar time and, and, and uh, people were, 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 were crying, maybe some of them. She was walking around with, with tissues and she wasn't being weird about it, but she just was making sure that, that people had what they needed. And I was watching her and I was thinking, man, nobody in this room even knows what this woman is doing because she's behind all of them. Nobody in this room really understands like how much that she's serving and how much she's giving. Nobody sees that, but I'm thinking, man, you know what? You know who does see that? I think... I think God sees that, right? God sees that. So I also found out later on that, that this isn't just like a Sunday morning thing that she does. Like she just like has this overflow in her life from this, this heart in a way that's dedicated to the Lord and surrendered to God. So even in her business, she imports some things to, to Columbia from other places, like nice things. And sometimes she gives them away for free. She'll give people and bless people with like really nice blankets and different things because it's just an overflow of who she is. What God has given her overflows out of her life and she's just generous and she's always serving, always giving. Super obvious to me watching her, but again, no one else saw her. She wasn't doing it for the recognition. She wasn't doing it for the pat on the back. She was just doing it. So I spoke to her afterwards and I was like, Hey, how you doing? What's your name? And she told me Ovaltina. And I was like, Ovaltine? <laughs> so I had to repeat it. And she said, Uvaldina. And I was like, that's better. Okay. Uvaldina. Good. <laughs> I said, how long have you been serving here? Uvaldina. And she told me 15 years. And I was like, you been doing this stuff for 15 years? She's like, yeah, I've been doing this stuff for 15 years. I've been mopping, you know, I'm, I'm talking to her and it's like, she's been mopping the floor. She's been helping the elderly. She's been making sure people have what they need. She's been greeting people. She's been meeting first time guests and stuff. And it was amazing. And, and God, I felt like I had like, I'm not saying this is a prophetic word. It wasn't, but I just, I felt like it was like an encouragement for her. And I wanted to remind her and I said, Uvaldina, I know that you're in the back of the room and you've been doing these things for years and maybe the temptation sometimes comes where it's like you feel like people don't see you, but I, but I, 
I just want to remind you, and I know that you already know this, but it's just a reminder and an encouragement for you that even if the people don't see you, God sees you and he's so pleased with you. I, I felt like that in my heart. I was like, I feel like God is so pleased with, with you doing this for his people, even though, and for him, even though no one sees you, no one congratulates you, nobody gives you the high five and the pat in the back. God doesn't just see your actions, but he sees your heart. And my encouragement was for her to keep a good heart to press on and a reminder that God sees you even if man does not. And it, it, it struck me and it made me think about how I think that heaven is gonna be full of surprises. Anybody ever thought of that? Heaven's gonna be full of surprises. And when we get there someday, it's like maybe, maybe I'm gonna be up in the nosebleed seats and I'm gonna be, even though I was on the stage in life, maybe I'm gonna be up in the nosebleeds, but I think heaven's gonna be full of surprises because I can think and I can imagine myself looking down to them first couple rows right up there in front of Jesus and see people like Uvaldina right there. I'm gonna be like, girl, you, oh, I cannot, that is so awesome, you did it. And according to the world, right, the world doesn't see her, but God sees her. It's so human for us to categorize people, to judge people based on only what we can see. We tend to put people on pedestals. Like, oh, he's the man of God. He speaks on stage. He is amazing or whatever, right? I, I, I mean, I'm okay, I guess. <laughs> or she's an amazing woman of God because she does X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. But God sees who we are in the quiet place. Like you can fake this, right? But you can't fake what's in your heart before the Lord who sees and judges by the heart. God sees who we are in the quiet place. So it's funny because when we read the scriptures, the disciples get hung up in this kind of stuff all the time. They're always hung up on like, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest of the 12 disciples? They're, they're going with Jesus, who is clearly the greatest, but it's funny and it's so human. And the disciples themselves do it because they're bickering among themselves like, well, Jesus is obviously the greatest, but who's his number one? Who's his number one? So let's see here. We'll read about the disciples arguing over who's the greatest of them. They did it multiple times. Let's check out James and John here, two of the disciples and what they do. Verse 35 of Mark 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to Jesus with a loaded question. They said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now I'm a parent. Like Andrea and I are parents of like a nine-year-old and a six-year-old girl. I've gotten this question before from these girls, right? Daddy, uh, I'm going to ask you something, but you have to say yes. <laughs> it's like, so, so, so Jesus is asked by these guys, we want you to do something for us, whatever we want. And Jesus responds to them. Jesus responds to them. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, well, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. They're basically asking for when Jesus is in heaven and he's sitting on the throne, that James, one brother, could sit on the left and John, the other brother, could sit on the right. And it's funny because Jesus tells them, guys, you have no idea. You have no idea what you're asking for and you have no idea what you're talking about right now. But they wanted, they wanted to know and they wanted to be the greatest. Jesus, let us be the greatest. Let us have those prime spots up there at your left and at your right. And let me tell you, when the rest of them disciples, when the rest of them boys heard about what James and John just tried to do, them guys were salty. Let's read here in verse 41. It says, when the 10 heard about what James and John had done, they became indignant they were mad. That's a strong word. And the kids would say big mad. They were big mad with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers and, and the ones who are the leaders, and I'm going to paraphrase this. He's basically telling them the ones who are leaders in this life, they kind of lord it over the people that they're above. They're very concerned about their authority and who's listening to them. And in verse 43, it says, but not so with you guys, these same guys that were just bickering over who's the greatest, not so with you guys. Instead, and I want you to hear this, 
whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Strong words. Verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served. And he had every right to be, right? He created the heavens and the earth. He could have come down, sat at a table, propped his feet up and said, massage my feet, do whatever I say. But instead of doing that, he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this is clearly the opposite of the way that the world does it, right? Like, like the worldly kingdoms and stuff is very concerned with who's on top, who's in charge, and everybody else is underneath them. But Jesus is not describing a kingdom like the kingdoms of man. Jesus is describing the kingdom of God and how that kingdom works. Well, that kingdom is an upside down kingdom. Jesus is describing an upside down kingdom in a way. The kingdom where the least becomes the greatest. The one who wants to be first must actually be like the last, like the servant of all. Like I said before, we have a little bit of an issue and maybe it's a human thing where we like to put people on pedestals and we see this in the culture. We see it on social media. It's actually amplified on social media all the time. We do that with celebrities who put them on a pedestal and our favorite singers, musicians, athletes, influencers. And I think we do this in church too. It's just a normal part of being human. Like we saw the disciples doing this. They're trying to kind of actually put themselves on pedestals, but we did this in church. I remember if we, if we look at maybe the last, you know, couple generations of church, like you can go back to a time maybe in the 80s or something where, where the people that we put on the pedestal in the church were, were the amazing preachers. It was like the thing to be like an amazing preacher and your suit and your tie and your cufflinks and you had st stacked and packed stadiums and, and these guys would, would be these amazing preachers. Guys like Jimmy Swaggart or, or Jim Baker, and they had all this audience and all these people spoke so well of them. These are the amazing men of God. And what happened to so many in that generation? They fell. They let us down. And a couple years later in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there was this big like prophetic kind of movement where it was like the rise of the celebrity prophets. And we ran around and we chased after this guy for a word of God. And we chased after this woman, this amazing prophet woman for this other word of God. And it was the celebrity prophets that were kind of the, the trend of the day. And they have many of them, not all of them, let us down in spectacular fashion. We put them on that pedestal and they let us down. In the 20 teens, maybe the 2010s and 20 teens, it was the rise of the influencer pastor, the Instagram perfect pastors. And we looked to them, we put them on a pedestal. And then yet again, many let us down. And nowadays, because this is kind of like, this is my world, right? The church world is my world. In the 2020s, it's the rise of, of the entrepreneur, business leader, leadership guru pastors. I like to call them the pastorpreneurs. <laughs> and we put them up on the pedestal. Oh, they're so amazing. They're so excellent. Everything they do is excellent. Everything they touch is turned to gold. And if we're not careful, we're going to put them up on the same pedestal that we just pushed all these other guys off of. And they're going to let us down too. And we wonder why this happens. Like you hear about pastors falling or church leaders falling, or I mean, it's not even strictly limited to the church. Like you see this with celebrities and musicians. It's like, I used to love that musician. I used to love that band until I found out that the lead singer was a total scumbag and they kind of fell, had him up on the pedestal. They couldn't live up to it and they fell. But we wonder why this happens over and over again, why we hear about pastors who've fallen and church leaders who've fallen. It's especially shameful for the church, right? Because they're supposed to be the ones who are leading us in Jesus' name. We think, I think it's because we think that being in the spotlight means that you're the greatest. That who's up, whoever's up on stage is automatically one of the best and one of the greatest because they got the lights on them. I think it's because we think that the greatest means to be in the spotlight. And we see this in our own lives and in our own kids' lives. When we were growing up, many of us, what do we want to be when we got older? I want to be a singer. 
I want to be a famous musician. I want to be a famous football player. I want to be a famous preacher. I want to have all the people looking at me, and I want the spotlight and the pat on the back, and everybody loves me. I want all these things. World or church, it doesn't matter. And I, I, I saw a study this is a study from a couple years ago, but they're asking kids like what they wanted to do with their life. And, and some years before that, it was like, what do you want to do? I want to be a lawyer, a teacher, or I want to be a singer, whatever, whatever it was. But in the last couple of years, like the number one thing has been, what do you want to be with your life? And the kids have been saying, I want to be a YouTube influencer. I want to be in the spotlight. I want to have all eyes on me. I want everyone to be looking at me. Now, let me tell you, you might think that you want the spotlight. There was times in my life where I thought I wanted the spotlight. I wanted to be famous. I thought it was, I thought it was the place to be. But let me tell you, in, in hindsight, the stage, the stage is a killer. It has killed so many people. If you're not careful, the stage can be a killer. It's killed many a man and many a woman because even though their talent was up here, their character was down here. Their talent outpaced their character. And they got all the recognition, but their character wasn't ready. It wasn't that foundation in a way under which they could actually stand, and they fell. The stage is tough because sometimes in, in church especially, like the stage, in a way, it makes a distinction between like the us and the you, right? If we're not careful. And I think if we're not careful, extra careful, the idea can be, well, ministry and church belongs to the people who do it on stage professionally. And I'm sitting here kind of along for the ride. I've been there. We put people up on pedestals. And what happens sometimes is us, us leaders, we can become entitled. I had a pastor many years ago. He told me something. He gave me a warning that I'll never forget. I'll never forget. This is like 20 years ago. He told me, Randy, beware the pat on the back. Beware the praises of men. Jesus famously, famously was like, I don't put anything into the praises of man because my identity does not rest in what mankind says about me. My identity rests in who God says I am. And I think a, a secret, maybe it's an open secret about what happens to, to, to people in the spotlight and on stages all over the place is that, is that a lot of people in leadership, we secretly love to be served. And as time goes on, we ourselves serve a little less and a little less and a little less. But Jesus is saying that the greatest can be like the least, but the, lead, the least is like the greatest. The funny thing is, and it's kind of ironic, is that greatness is not out of reach for anyone. That's totally biblical. Greatness is not out of reach for anyone because anyone can serve. Philippians 2, verse 3, Paul says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others, but be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. That's tough to do when you're in competition with everybody. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. It says, you must the next verse, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Can we go to the next slide, please? You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Can we go back to that? I'm so sorry. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Basically, though he created the heavens and the earth himself, and he was the author of life itself, he, in verse 7, it says that he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. You see, the author of life served. He served until he had nothing left. The author of life, 
the author of life. He was the one who invented life. And he gave up his own life in service so that others might live. I see from the back of the room, my position as a pastor in, in church, I see in a way metaphorically from the back of the room, I see all kinds of people in this church do all kinds of amazing things. It's so awesome to witness. We have a, a Thanksgiving outreach where, where we, we basically give Thanksgiving meals out to, to a bunch of people who, who are in need, who, don't, who probably wouldn't otherwise have the ability to have a Thanksgiving dinner. And we do, a, we do like a, a lineup. So people take their cars in here. We transform the parking lot and we make all these different stations. And they pull in a line of cars and they'll pull in. And these aren't church people, a lot of them. <clears throat> they'll come in and they'll stop at the first station and, and they, they check in and then they go to the next station and they'll pick up like the fixings, like all the stuffing and the gravy and all that stuff. They'll pick those up and we'll put those in the car. And there's people over there at that station that are serving them. And then those cars will go to the next station and it's like, this is where you get your, your frozen turkey. And there's people that are there and they're serving them. They put the frozen turkey into the, into the vehicle. And then after they're done getting all the stuff at all the different stations, these people in their cars, they swing around. And on the way out, we have one last station. And it's a station where we've kind of stacked the deck, so to speak. It's a, it's a prayer station. And it's funny because, I'm, I mean, I'm sure some people are like, I'm not interested in prayer. But to tell you the truth, like 99% of the people who come to the Thanksgiving drive stop at the prayer section. This is the prayer section out there. And we've stacked the deck because the people that are there doing the prayer are some of the, like, the most amazing, humble, kind, loving, faith-filled prayer warrior encouragers that you could ever imagine. So the funny thing is these people don't know, you know, they're coming in, they're getting their needs met, their needs met, which is very important, but we want to make sure that their ultimate need is met in Jesus Christ. So I can sit there with a bird's eye view and watch these people pull up, roll down their window, and then they meet some of the most amazing people ever, and those people are praying for them. And I'm watching as these people run on their windows. They're not sure what to expect. The people are very kindly asking if they can pray for them. They start to pray. And I'm watching tears stream down, stream down these people's faces. There's some amazing people in this church serving and giving their all. Yesterday, we had a serve day. It was like a rescheduled sites because we had rain on our actually annual annual serve day. It was a it was a site where there's a there's an older gentleman in town here. He's a widower. He, his wife died a couple of years ago and he's he's getting up in age. He's 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 having a hard time being mobile and getting around and we heard about him and he had a need so I remember I went over there and I met him just to see what the need was and he, he lives in a neighborhood but his his front yard like his flower beds what used to be flower beds were completely completely overrun. They were full of saplings and vines and things that had once been plants this big had now climbed up over his windows and were like up going onto his roof and over his gutter. He actually has two front doors that he can't use because they're both completely covered and blocked with vegetation and overgrown stuff and thorn bushes and whatever. He actually only comes in and out of the house through the driveway, through the garage. And when I met with him there, he has a chair that he sits out in front of his garage and he sits there and he told me he sits there all day. And that his, that his life, like the, his favorite part of life is watching the chipmunks and the squirrels and the birds because he doesn't have anybody else. And these people yesterday gave of their time, gave of their ability. I'm not, I don't know that any of them is a professional landscaper or something like that, but they gave their time and their ability and they went and they served this man. They met this man over there yesterday at his house and they completely transformed his front yard. They cut down those saplings. They trimmed back those wild bushes. They pulled up all the vines. They got rid of all this overgrowth and trimmed back these super tall grass and they put down mulch and made it a beautiful front yard for this man. And after it was over and this man was being overcome come by gratefulness because he didn't understand why these people would come and be willing to give their time to do something for him when he has no one else to do things for him. Then the team spent time and prayed with him at the end. And I love it because it doesn't take a big show to make a big difference it doesn't take the stage and the microphone. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Sometimes it's, the, it's just the everyday, actually most of the time, almost all the time, it's just the everyday actions of everyday people of which I am too 
that can make a tremendous difference in people's lives, even make the ultimate difference, which is bringing eternal life. It doesn't take the big show. And I love to see these people and many others like them that they serve, and they're not just serving because they, 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 they're checking a box, although I've been there. Sometimes maybe, maybe it's natural for humans. We check a box. We just got to do it. It's just something we're supposed to do. But, but I think that the power and the blessing comes from when we try to align our hearts with the Lord's heart and say, God, I don't want to go through this checking a box and just doing things because I have to. I want to do this in an act and an offering of worship to you, Lord. You think Jesus went to the cross just to check a box? No, his heart was right. He went to the cross, he gave up his life, and he served till his last breath. This comes up over and over in Scripture. In fact, maybe one of the most famous stories in the Bible is the Last Supper. And it's funny because, again, all the disciples are at the table and Jesus ends up telling them, listen, one of you is going to betray me. And these disciples, they start looking around at each other. They're like, who is it? He doesn't mean me. It's not, surely it's not me, is it? And the very next verse in that, in that story of the Last Supper has them start again to start bickering and arguing about who the greatest among them is. So the sense is like, Jesus says to them, one of you is going to betray me. It's like me, it wouldn't, who's it, you, me? It wouldn't be me, I'm John. I'm James. I was there, baby. I was with Jesus on the mountain. I am the greatest. I would never do such a thing. And they're arguing and they're bickering. And Jesus doesn't respond by telling them to knock it off. He doesn't respond by giving them a lecture. He simply responds, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth the one who had all right for himself to be served. This God gets up, he ties a towel to his waist, and he walks around the table and washes each and every one of their feet. You see, that was a culture and a custom that we don't have anymore today. And the fact is that back then, the culture was different. They wore sandals a lot, and they walk in non-paved, dusty roads, and they'd come to each other's houses and the door would open and they would be greeted by a servant, the lowest servant of the household. And that servant would have a bowl of water and it was their job to take that guest's feet, the invited guest's feet and wash them and dry them and then move out of the way so that the people could enter into the house with clean, clean feet. That's what the servants did. That's what the slaves did. And this is what Jesus was showing us. So verse 12 of John 13 says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and you call me Lord and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, remember, you were just arguing over who the greatest is. And since I am greater than you and I have humbled myself to do this to you and for you, you ought to wash each other's feet. He says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. And he finishes with this. This is like some of his last words. It's like the last words of his, of his amazing Last Supper. Some of the last words of that Last Supper. And he says, now that you know these things, God will bless you because you know them. God will bless you because you understand them. 
God will bless you because you've heard them. No, God will bless you for doing them. And he sent those disciples, those same grumbling disciples, arguing about who the greatest among them was. He took them, showed them a better way, and sent them out to the world where they would go and speak with a voice like thunder and call masses of people to them because of the gift that God had given them and multiplied in them. And sometimes they would pray for people and the sick would be miraculously healed and thousands of people would be drawn to those disciples who before had been arguing about who the greatest is, but now they understood that their job was to surrender their life in service to the one who first gave up his life for us. So what I want to do today I just want to take a little bit of time. I really think it's that important. You see it so many times in Scripture, and it's such like, in a way, a basic teaching that we, we, we can almost forget. But Jesus is very strong in his words to us. He's not blessed just if we understand what he's saying. It's not blessed. We're not blessed if we can just acknowledge that that's a great thing that he said. He says we're blessed when we do these things. And I want to give us all an opportunity right now to Reflect on that word. The word that the Lord gave us thousands of years ago through his disciples and the word that still stands above all the rest today. And you might be saying, I don't have anything to give. I feel like I'm not talented in anything. But let me tell you that the Lord always multiplies the offering. And if you offer your life to him, he has an amazing supernatural way of making it so much more. He took five little loaves and two little fish, enough to feed a boy one boy's lunch. And he took that and multiplied that to feed thousands and thousands of people. If he can do that with some fish and some bread, he can do that with you. Do you understand that today? So if you guys would, if you guys wouldn't mind standing to your feet with me. And maybe we just spend this time. I'm going to do it too. I'm not above doing this. We're all together called the church, right? We're all, we're all supposed to be followers of Jesus. Those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus. Let's just spend some time right now and just press into the Lord and surrender, re-surrender, not just our hearts, but our hands and our feet.